Welcome to the Louisville Genealogical Society um, meeting and program. I am Jean Luer, our current president. I'll call this meeting to order and ask Donna Brewster to read the minutes from the March meeting. All right. Um, the meeting was called to order at 1 p.m. by President Jean Lure. Donna Brewster read the minutes of the February 22nd meeting. Uh, motion. Betty Graham motioned and Lynn Grossman seconded that the minutes of the meeting of February 22nd, having been circulated by email, be approved. The motion was approved without objections. Maureen Fitzgerald gave the treasurer's report, which had been approved by the board on March the 8th. We now, have, we now have 217 paid members. Penny Willer, I'm sorry, Penny Weller has accepted the position of historian and Carol Whitledge is the new assistant seminar, seminar chair. She will be the seminar chair for 2023. Susan Snyder reported on the preparations for the trip to the Allen County Public Library in Fort Wayne, Indiana. That's May the 15th through the 21st. The ACPL has the largest genealogical collection east of the Mississippi River. More information will appear in the next newsletter. The fall trip to the, to the Family History Library in Salt Lake City will be September the 4th through the 11th. The group will stay at the Plaza Hotel, which is right next to the library. Please connect, contact Susan if you are interested. A new Sergeant at Arms is still needed. One of the jobs of this position is to set up the technology for the in-person meetings and programs. Sergeant is also responsible for keeping an eye on the weather and alerting us in case of tornado warnings, zombie attacks, et cetera. Two or three people are still needed to audit the finances of the society. The LGS will try for an in-person meeting in June. Lynn Grossman announced that the Tuesday, April 12th program at, at one o'clock will be resting in peace at Cave Hill Cemetery presented by Brian Bush. There's no need to register for this program. The link to the Zoom event is on the website. The Tuesday, April 26th workshop will be Kentucky Migration, Pathways to Settlement. Register on the website and, on, and the link will be sent to you. Lynn introduced Dr. Charles Ray, an educator and native of Edmondson County, Kentucky, who presented How Genealogy Found a Missing Edmondson County Woman, perfectly submitted. Thank you. Do we have a motion to approve? No, the, approve those. Did we approve those minutes at the board meeting or do we? No, we need to approve them today. Yeah. All right, yeah. I'll get this straight. All right. Do I hear a motion? I'll make a motion, Nancy. Okay. I think I'll make a me. second, Betty Graham. Betty Graham second the motion. Any objections? All right, then I'll declare that the Minutes have been approved. Maureen Fitzgerald could not make it today. So I uh, have uh, her treasures report to give. That This is the March report. She closes, closes it out at the end of the month. So that's almost a month before our uh, current meeting. <clears throat> we had uh, an income of $242.17 in March, expenses of $727.39, a checking account balance at the as of 32322, $17,293.15, and the membership at that point was 220. And that treasurer's report was approved in uh, our last board meeting. Okay, Susan, do you want to mention anything about the trip to Fort Wayne? I would like to just remind everybody that the trip is the, the third week of May and also that the hotel rooms at the group rate are held until the 1st of May. So if you're gonna go, you need to go ahead and get um, get your reservations and please let me know when you've made your reservation so I can keep track of how many rooms we have. And you don't have to go for the whole week. As someone told me the other day, they can only go for like three days and that's fine. You can still get those same rates, but uh, just let me know. And hopefully we don't have a very large group going. 
but it'll still be good and you can still do lots of research. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Lynn uh, Grossman is going to promote, uh, comment on the anniversary luncheon. We normally have an anniversary luncheon in July to celebrate the anniversary of Louisville Genealogical Society. Due to COVID, there has been no luncheon in the last two years. We need to know how many people are interested in going to an in-person luncheon. In that vein, we have sent, Howard has sent out an email blast to all members. If you have not seen it, please check your spam mail and respond if you're going to choose one of the options, which is in-person luncheon, option one, option two, uh, in-person meeting in the church, option three, a Zoom meeting. You do not need to respond if you're not planning to attend any of those options. We do need to hear from you so we know how many people are interested and are willing. And I know we're all more than willing to go if things would settle down and we could feel safe going. We're not gonna know that right away and we may have to cancel at the last minute. Hopefully, we won't have to do that. Please Thank you. for your email and respond. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, uh, Nancy Robertson has a slew of announcements, so I'm just going to turn it over to her for right now. <laughs> Thank you, Jean. Uh, I'm going to announce uh, we have lots of activities going on in May. And so just want to let everybody know, um, remember you can see all these activities on our website, kylgs.org or Google the Louisville Genealogical Society and you can see all these activities posted and more information about them. But coming up the first Tuesday in May is our regular uh, German SIG group and it meets at two o'clock. Information is on our website and the link to join this meeting is on our website. So if you have any Germans and would like to join our German special interest group, we welcome you the first Tuesday of the month. Then our second Tuesday of the month is our program um, day. And we have Beth Wilder, who's going to present a brief history of Jefferson Town and its people. She will focus on Jefferson Town events and people beginning with the first settlers who arrived in the late 1700s. So that's Tuesday, May 10th, and you need to register for that uh, on our website. Uh, of course, our spring trip up to Allen County Public Library, like Susan said, is our third week in May. Uh, Sunday, May 15th through Saturday, May 21st. And like Susan said, if you only can go for a few days, it's only a four hour drive up there. Uh, and we still have rooms available at the hotel. So check our website uh, if you're interested or contact any of us if you'd like to know more about this information or contact Susan. So we'd love to have, a, have some more people join us up there in Allen County or in Fort Wayne at the Allen County Public Library. And then the fourth Tuesday of the month in May, our last event is uh, our workshop. And we have Derek Blout, who's gonna present, bring out your dead, plague, pandemics, and epidemics in your ancestry. This should be a really interesting uh, workshop. Uh, Derek's gonna discuss epidemics from the 1200s to the present and where to find unusual records about the epidemics and records of people that succumb to them. So uh, coming off of our little pandemic, a little bit so little, our pandemic, uh, this might be quite interesting for you to use and to resource for your ancestry. Uh, we'd also like to remind you to save the date, our annual fall family seminar is going to occur Saturday, October 15th this year. And we have national known speaker, Angie McGee, who's going to be our speaker that day. 
and registration and more information will be available very soon on our website. Um, also the topics that Angie will be presenting. So if you're interested in that, please check our website and see what Angie's going to be presenting and we'll probably open for registration here in a month or so. Um, so that's all our announcements, lots of activities going on, something for everybody. Uh, and I just, I'm amazed. We have 87 people so far on uh, Zoom today to listen to Sherry Daniels. We want to welcome all of you to our workshop today and remind you that you can access all these events on our website. And we also remind you to please check and make sure you've renewed your membership if you have not done so yet. Uh, you can go and try to log in. And if you can't log in or you have not been receiving our newsletter, which comes out the first of every month, then you probably have not paid your dues for 2022. So please check and pay your dues if you haven't. And if you're a guest today, we welcome you to join our society. We have lots of activities. We'd love to have you join us. You can do that on our webpage by using your credit card or PayPal. So our presentation today is with Sherry Daniels, Kentucky Migration Pathways to Settlement. Um, we will have a Q&A session following her presentation, and we ask you to use the chat um, to post your questions, and then we'll field those questions at the end of the presentation. There is no handout today, so I know people right away are always looking for that handout, and uh, there isn't one. You're just going to have to listen closely and pay attention to Sherry. So Sherry Daniels, it's really exciting here. She is our new director of the National Sons of American Revolution Genealogical Research Library, which is housed right here in Louisville. We are so fortunate. And now we get Sherry uh, to be in that position as the director of their library. So we congratulate her on that. She also serves as a producer for a, a new statewide TV show, Kentucky Ancestors by the Kentucky Historical Society. And since 2020, she's a very busy lady, Sherry has produced and hosted the Blood Root podcast. So a little bit about Sherry, for over 25 years, she's worked in various types of libraries, including 11 years at the University of Kentucky and 10 years at the Kentucky Historical Society. She holds a BA in history, an MA in library science, of course, from her University of Kentucky, she is also a contributing author to the 2018 book from McFarland Publishers, Genealogy and the Librarian. So we are honored and thrilled to have you with us today, Sherry. So welcome, Sherry. And we're going to turn the meeting over to you and your presentation, Kentucky Migration Pathways to Settlement. Thank you so much, Nancy. And thank you all for having me here today. Um, as you can tell, anyone who's ever listened to me before, this is not my normal voice. Um, I'm coming down off of bronchitis and laryngitis, which I had all last week. So bear with me. Um, I may go slower than I normally do in my presentations. And if I just, if you hear a pause, just know I'm, I'm getting a sip of tea or, or something to keep me going because, you know, <clears throat> this, this, it should last through the presentation, but you know it, it's going to be a little bit of a little bit rough going. Um, again, thank you all for having me here. Um, you guys are my first presentation as the new library director, so this is really special, especially because it's in Louisville. Um, and so this is this is really a, a great a great thing that that it, it's the Louisville group that has me speaking, and since I'm right here in Louisville, so. Um, that's really exciting. And anybody who, if you don't know who I am before, I mean, Nancy had mentioned the fact that, um, that I was 10 years with the Kentucky Historical Society and technically for the next few days, I will still technically an employee of theirs. Um, she mentioned the TV show that had just come out season two of Kentucky Ancestors. And that is now airing in Kentucky, um, in the state on ABC affiliate stations. And for those of you outside of the state, if you keep, uh, just check in with the Kentucky Historical Society um, YouTube channel, they will every month play the new episode so you can get that for free anytime. But that's that's some really, basically these are Kentucky brick walls that we were solving. And so those are, those are really fun to watch. But getting back to the 
the new place here, the Sons of the American Revolution. For those of you who've never been here, if you are ever in the region, in the area, this is an amazing place to stop in. Um, we have been operating under by appointment only for quite a while with COVID, but now on May 2nd, we are open fully once again um, to walk-in visitors. So it's free admission to DAR, SAR, several of the other little groups there, lineage societies. But if you're not affiliated with any of those, um, it's only $5 a day to come in and research. So, and it's a national collection. This is not just Kentucky based. You would get a lot of material here, over 55,000 volumes. And in fact, at the very end of this presentation, I will show you a picture of the library so you can see if you've never been here before, what that would look like. So I'm gonna jump right into the presentation here, Kentucky Migration Pathways to Settlement. If I can share my screen with you all. All right, you should be seeing the title, the title page. So one of the things that I talk about with migration and pathways to settlement, um, I also talk about the routes in and out because we have a lot of family groups that came into Kentucky, but not all the family members stayed. And there are quite a few groups that actually went back out, um, usually farther west. Sometimes they went back home. Um, but I think that the migration routes in and out are something that you need to be um, to be cognizant of as you research in Kentucky. So we know a lot of pathways coming in through the mountains and down the river. Those are the two main ways that the early populations, early European populations are getting into Kentucky. Um, and then later on, you start to see a little bit more coming up through, maybe crossing over through from Tennessee. I had a branch of my family that settled first in Western Tennessee and then later crossed over into the southern portions of Kentucky. And then of course you've got a lot of people that are coming, going back out west, you know, just continuing on. Um, they don't, they may not have stayed here permanently. Um, and some people are investing out west and so they're coming back and forth. So be thinking about the major routes in and out of Kentucky because that can affect where your records may reside. So did your family leave behind any kind of clues as to how they got here. Um, in my family, I have two family artifacts um, that my great grandmother left behind to our family. One was this an iron kettle. This is not the exact iron kettle, but it's one very much like that. And then this other little, I actually use it as a toothpick holder, but I think it's a little egg holder. Um, that one is the original. That's the one that I have in my house. Basically, she passed them down to us <clears throat> and she said one came over the mountains and one came down the river on a flat boat. Now, unfortunately, she didn't remember which family was which or which one came down the flat boat, down the river or across the mountains. So I don't know. And I have my suspicions about there are several routes. There are several groups of my family that came down the river. And but as far as who came through the mountain, I actually don't know. Um, there's a couple of little potential families, uh, some groups that I need to research to see if that's how they came up, but I have so many that were in the north and this side of the family, I don't know of anybody coming through the mountains. So I've got a lot more research to do uh, to figure that out. But did your family have any stories that might have pointed how they actually got here? Um, the why <clears throat> several of these families come in is a really big deal. Try to sit back and think about why are they coming in? And this is a list of them right now. So financial, family, land, health, opportunity, war, speculation, a lot of these, many of these can apply. It's not just one thing. Um, you have a lot of people that were coming in for opportunities, different kinds of opportunities. And a lot of times they're clustering with their families or with different, different immigration groups. So, but think about that because as you do think about for either direction, how they're coming in, how they're leaving, um, you know, the reasons behind why they're coming in can greatly affect um, where those records end up. So 
where might they have? So if there's a federal reason that they're coming in, can end up in the federal records. State government, what did we collect on the state government level that might document that your ancestors are coming in? And I'll go over a few of those later. Religious institutions, um, are there some religious movements coming in? I know we had some major religious movements once people, people kind of the early years, um, and some of those actually may have went to regional religious institutions. Educational, family archives, what did you pass down? What is still there? Um, private and public nonprofit repositories in the area. So be thinking about reasons and how it might actually pinpoint where those records ended up. So I do like to go over a little bit of early Kentucky history with everyone, just to kind of paint a bit of a picture as far as our migration for Kentucky, because our early history is just, our early history is migration. I mean, that's what Kentucky is. We were, you know, we were Western territory. So that migration West is a huge chunk of our history. So prior to European settlement, we had a lot of indigenous populations in this territory. They were seasonally nomadic, but they based hunting and production centers in this place we now know of as Kentucky. You had several tribes that would do this, Cherokee, Chickasaw, Shawnee, and some others. And when we talk about production centers, this isn't just, you know, these were seasonally, they would come in during the warm and warmer months and they would, they would live for quite a while because they would be producing um, arrowheads and, and the different things that they needed to continue the hunting that was going on. In fact, my, um, my grandfather who lived in Pendleton County, which is more close to the Ohio River, every year that he would plow up the field to plant it, he would have to dump one of those, you know, the large um, buckets, the bu large plastic buckets you see on the farms. Everybody's got so many of those. Every year he would fill a whole bucket full of arrowheads as, as the mules plowed the field and he would have to take them and dump them in the creek down at the bottom of the hill. So we're talking massive amounts of production and everything that was going on prior to European settlement. And when European settlers started coming, now I've got on here exploring as early as 1760s. Now we know some of them were here a little bit earlier than that, but you know, that's, you know, exploring, that's, you know, by 1760s, you've got white men bringing enslaved men in with them for a purpose. They're coming to hunt, scouting, land speculation. This territory they believe is marked as part of Virginia. And I have a question mark there because we're gonna explore a little bit about why that's not necessarily completely accurate, especially not with the 1760s. But as they're coming in, you know, they're eyeballing this area. This is like, okay, this is the next frontier. This is the next place we're going. What does that structure look like? So they're coming in with a purpose. Now I've got on here post-revolutionary war, how that also brought a much larger group of settlers in because of land grants due to military service. However, before the revolutionary war, you had, um, there was land given in Kentucky for those who fought in the French and Indian war. So it does predate, there is a, there's a little phase there where it predates even Revolutionary War territory given um, to soldiers. You've, and I will cover a little bit more of the land records and those different, those different um, uh, groupings. But, you know, I'm gonna have to, sorry, I'm gonna have to, whoops, lost my mouse there. So anyway, um, back to Virginia, what was the Virginia territory like? And this map is a map of the territorial limits of the Cherokee Nation of Indians. And each batch, each piece of land that you see here is when they were seceding land in some, in some agreement, some, even if it was a duplicitous agreement, whatever, this is gonna give us a little bit more of the time frame. And I want you to take a look at the timing on this. So 1770, this little tiny corner of Kentucky is really, that's, that's the only part of Virginia that European settlers should have been coming in. They should have been stopping, you know, right past that, but they didn't, you know, they didn't. They kept going. Um, by 1772, we had this wonderful big chunk up here now. 
that encompassed along the Ohio River. Now, that's fantastic. And you would think that we would get a whole lot of people coming down that river with that opening up in 72. Oh, not so much. And the reason why is because right on the other side is clearly Shawnee territory. Um, and I'm going to show you again how significant that was, that presence uh, of those Indian tribes on the other side of the river. That's a big deterrent. Um, it's a long patch of river there from, from either Pennsylvania uh, or Virginia, you know, what we now know is West Virginia present day. So that's a big stretch of river. So you'd think that that would be their, their first port of call coming in because the river is a great way, a fast way to come down, but it just, it was a little too dangerous. By 1775, we now have all of this that's opened up and that's where the pathways through the gap start hitting us. We start getting a lot more of that traffic coming through. But what's happening in 1775? 75, we're suddenly at war with Britain. Um, this then becomes the westward, the western part of the Revolutionary War. It's it's this is the territory. A lot of the um the attacks and um skirmishes that you you encounter that you read about, it's their mixed forces. Uh, of both Indian tribes and British forces, and they're attacking settlers because Britain does, they don't want them here. And the, and the tribes don't want them here either. So it becomes part of the war effort to try to drive them out or even capture them. There are several that were captured and taken all the way up to Quebec. I mean, you've got, uh, that's a, a huge part of our history right in that time frame during the revolution. So here's just an idea. This is, or just an example. This is 1785. Now, this is not Kentucky, um, but this is a map from 1785. The Kentucky Historical Society has this map. And you can see the Ohio River down at the bottom. This is a plan of Indian fortifications that were along the Muskegon River as it hit the Ohio. Now, those are, you're looking at the northern part right up along the, the Muskegon, so the top of your screen. Those are pretty significant um, fortifications. So those are just very well established. And if somebody's gonna to try to come down the Ohio River, look how close these, these major centers are um, for, for the indigenous groups that are, that are in this area. The tiny, I don't know if any of you, if you can actually see them. There's a very tiny little circular thing down there at the bottom, right at the influx where next to Ohio, it's in the left corner. That's British Fort. So the size of the British Fort in relation to the Indian fortifications at the top, it's still a very dangerous time. Now, 1785, you know, we already have limestone turning into Maysville. They're still coming. Make no mistake, the, the settlers are coming. It's just that it's dangerous. And, you know, our, our ancestors, they, it was not an easy way to go, but they came anyway. So continuing on from 1772 to 76, this area was called Fincastle County, Virginia. The name Kentucky was introduced in 1776 when Kentucky County, Virginia was formed. And subsequently in 1780, the area was divided into three original counties, Fayette, Jefferson, and Lincoln, which as most of you know, if you're researching back into this period, this time period, you do have to shift your research focus back into these earlier counties. Statehood in 1792 brought even more settlers because of course we're after the revolution, we're a state now, over the mountains and down the Ohio River, those are the two main paths coming in. And a lot of those paths, don't forget through the Cumberland Gap, those are original, those are Indian trails coming in. So European settlers have adapted those and coming on in and even improved some of them, I mean, you know, physically improved some of those so that we could get larger groups of people in. So, which took a lot of money which we'll talk about in, a, in just a, a little bit. Briefly, 19th century history, continue, continuing on the migration. So War of 1812, Kentucky contributed the most men, but the land awarded for service was not in Kentucky. Um, this sent many of our Kentuckians to Illinois territory. And so that's just something to think about. Another motivation of why we actually, a Kentucky settler might've left or part of the family might have left. 1840s and 50s, we see an influx of Irish and German immigrants um, and their chosen areas of settlement were very different, urban, uh, much more urban than rural. And you're talking about 
Louisville area, obviously, and then Cincinnati, Covington areas. And interestingly enough, let's say that you had those groups, or, sorry, let's say you had ancestors from those groups coming in and, you know, but you know that your ancestor was a farmer that was maybe, I don't know, a few counties away from these urban centers. Well, that may be so, but it's like in the case of my family, they came in during the Migration Act, they basically touched base or settled first, briefly in the urban center area of Cincinnati. Then after they filed their um, declarations of intent to become a citizen, they then moved over into Kentucky, bought up nice parcels of land, and they were farmers the rest of their life. So even if you know where they eventually settled, don't forget these urban centers as places to look for records that you can connect back to your ancestors. Because a lot of these places had the newspapers that were specific to these groups, sometimes in their language. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that had some of their families stayed in the urban areas while they went to, you know, to, to farm a few counties away. So don't ever, you know, just because they became agricultural doesn't mean that they still don't have ties to these urban centers. Civil War, again, we have more people coming in neutral, but then split allegiance with two governments, one union, one Confederate. We were a slave state exempt from the Emancipation Proclamation, but we had, um, we had one of the first, um, well, it was United States Colored Troop. That's what USCT stands for. So African-American unit uh, for the union was at Camp Nelson here in Kentucky. Um, and actually, I'm going to go back to that for a second. The reason I mentioned the Civil War, and, and a lot of this is, and I will kind of go a little bit more, but that's another, those are, those are, that's an event that basically kind of, it kind of helps to scatter some people especially those that are maybe newly emancipated um, who were enslaved. You know, it's, it's something that stirs the pot in Kentucky. So it might be a reason why people are coming in or going out. So be thinking of that. So if we're going to map the routes for Kentucky, people coming in, there is a lot of change over time that we have to take into consideration. Obviously, one of the things we try to do is we try to find extant maps that are going to relate to the time frame in which we're, we are re researching our ancestors. And so pay attention to those publication dates. And even if you don't have a super, super early one, there are many of the early ones that were adapted and then republished later. So kind of look at the lineage of a map that can help a little bit. Um, do you have any stories or oral histories that can help point you to certain areas? Don't forget that directions and landmarks do change over time, sometimes significantly. And even roads change. Routes of roads change. Even water courses can change. Um, you know, don't, don't get too, too drawn in to just what you see on a map is, you know, is the way it is or set in stone. A lot of things can change. It can help guide you. But again, there are some things that change. My um, one of my family's a farm in Bourbon County, the back portion of that property has what they call the old road. And it was an old road that existed during the Civil War, but it doesn't exist anymore. And sadly, people have used it as a dumping ground. But you can clearly see where this old road used to be. So there's a lot of instances in Kentucky where things have changed. And like I said, don't even forget water courses can change as well. Now, there's also something to be considered when it comes to advances in map, map making. I was talking about extant maps. We're trying to look for those maps that maybe existed at the time of when your ancestor would have migrated or settled here. Well, that's great if you find them. And there are a lot of very old maps out there for Kentucky for the early period, but they weren't always as um, precise as they may be today. And I'm gonna show you guys an example. So most of you have heard of the of John Filson and his map, his Kentucky map. We see this a lot. Um, the first edition he did was 1784. And that's what this is right here. Now, he says map of Kentucky. Of course, he spells it a little bit different. And this is drawn from actual observations. 
is inscribed with the most perfect respect to the Honorable Congress of the United States of America and to His Excellency George Washington, late commander in chief of their army. Now, this is 1784 and he has, he has put this wonderful label on here. The reason being is because he also had a book that went with this. He's trying to lure people to settle here. And I will get a little bit, I will get into why he's doing this a little bit later on. He's basically a land speculator. So he has 13,000 acres that he needs to, he needs to offload. He needs to get settlers to come in here and pay him to settle. And so he's trying to make this just seem as most as uh, much of a utopia as possible. Now, in 1784, he is trying his best to get some, some sort of endorsement in order to publish the next edition because it was very, very popular. 1785, he's trying to get the next edition out. And he asks George Washington to endorse what he has done here because as many of you remember, George Washington was a surveyor. But George Washington says this about that map. He says, it has long been my wish to see an extensive and accurate map of the Western territory set on foot and amply encouraged. But I would have this work founded upon actual surveys and careful observations. Anything short of these, in my opinion, not only defective and of little use, but serve as often to mislead as to direct the examiner. So that was his his blunt way of saying, no, I'm not going to endorse the next map. Because for those of you who've ever looked at that map carefully, it's off. It's, it's very off. It's, it's, um, it's just not right. You can tell that it's not been done by actual surveying techniques. Um, and so a lot of people look at this and go, oh, this is an early Kentucky map. Ooh, it is. And there are some things that are identifiable. But for anybody that actually knows Kentucky in comparison to modern day maps, this is kind of uh, this is kind of a disaster. There, you know, there's there's things all over the place that are just out of place. So, here's one. Like I said, I'm allowed to show you this because I'm still a Kentucky Historical Society employee for the next few days. So, in the 1960s, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Now, be careful. This map is on its side right now. I'm going to flip it in just a minute. But the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, they took the Filson map, and they decided to resurvey and put all of the different landmarks and pathways <coughs> that you would have seen. And therefore they would have been put in the proper place. This is an amazing map. I love this map so much. Um, now it's right side up. So it would be just like the original Filson. And what's great about this is so is for mapping the migration paths This map is really amazing because they have all the different trails that are coming out through the gap and then all the way into central Kentucky. And you have all the different little forts and little stations and everything. And they're in the precise location, not according to what Filson had put on there. And it is really, really wonderful. Now, how you, how would you go explore this map? Actually, you would go to um, kyhistory.com and then just type in Filson, and it'll be one of your results, one of your early results right there um, as a map. And you can download a copy. Um, I think I uploaded a larger edition of this to the Kentucky Ancestors Facebook group. Um, so you can look for one there as well. But again, and if you want to really, cause this is a big map, it's about, it's like table size. It's a huge map, but it's like made of like this plastic kind of almost like a plastic vellum. It's, it's, it's a very interesting, so it's very durable. But if you go in to the Historical Society Library and ask for this, you can get that out and really, really play with it. But the resolution should be high enough to where you can get in and zoom in just a little bit. On- so here's another one that you will see published quite a lot. The original was done in 1795, but then it's been republished it's several different places, a lot of books, you will see this one. So this is the road from limestone to Frankfurt. And so along the Ohio River, limestone is of course our earliest port of call. It is the first one that we really developed as a landing spot. And then people took roads right down into, road, duh, not, not, not plural, a road down into the bluegrass, down into the Lexington area. 
But what I love about this is for if anybody is looking at this, getting a little, you know, they're not sure exactly how to read this map. This map, what I love is it is the perspective of the traveler. So instead of looking down on it like a bird, if you see the Ohio River in the landing limestone, it's right down in the little left hand corner. And then it's literally, if you got off a boat and you were going down the road all the way to Lexington and then over to Frankfurt, that those are all the different little landmarks that you would encounter along the way. So I love that because that's the traveler's perspective from the 1790s. That's what our ancestors would have um, would have encountered along their way. And I don't know if you could see there's one, there's salt works that's there. I mentioned health, you know, uh, that's one thing, and especially in the early 19th century, you know, all the different salt works that we have and mineral works and things like that. That was another health reason people were coming as well. And that was a financial investment people were investing. So I mentioned the Kentucky Secretary of State Land Office because I was talking about land records for a moment. If you were talking about early migration, this site, you really need to just um, spend some time with this. Um, I'm not going to give you the URL because it's usually pretty long. It's like sos.ky.gov, whatever. So just Google Kentucky Secretary of State Land Office and you will get there. And the reason why this is so important for migration and paths of settlement is because there are so many waves of people that came through with these different groups of records for just to, just to settle the land in Kentucky. And I'm telling you to go ahead and um, spend time with this website because each one of those different record sets or what I would kind of consider land settlement categories, each one of them is a different database that you need to look through. And Candy Atkinson, the goodness, the, the land record goddess um, that, this, that works there, she has put so many educational leaflets and handouts. There's loads of handouts in there um, that will explain all of the different types. So one of the things that she said, let me see, I'm gonna pull this up. I'm not gonna show you guys, I'm just going to, one of the, one of the PDFs and I will try to put a link into the chat later on, just remind me you guys. Um, she's got the Kentucky Land Patent Series and she says that there are nine different types um, based on time period and land location. So the major, the nine major groupings, you, want to, you would need to look through each one of these. Now, have they digitized everything? I don't know that they've digitized everything. I've heard there's about two thirds that are finished. Once you do get there and look through these databases, those images you're seeing right here, they're high resolution, free, downloadable. You can get them all. Um, it's a beautiful site. But she mentions like Virginia series, Old Kentucky series, South of Green River, Teleco, Kentucky Land Warrant series, South of Walker's Lion series, West of Tennessee River Military series, West of Tennessee River series, and County Court Order series. So even if you know where your ancestor finally settled, sometimes they came in through this system. Either they were an original holder of, let's say, a treasury warrant, or they made some improvements and then got a preemption warrant for more land, and maybe they eventually sold it off. That's fine, but that's tracing some of their movements. Eventually, now, these land records will usually only get you so far. You eventually then have to get into deed transfers if you want to really trace a piece of land. Um, but for the early migration periods, this is, this is a gold mine. And this, the, the white section you see over here with all the different multiple little thumbnails, that's just if you pull up one, Candy has then went and pulled out the other documents that are associated with let's say the original land office treasury warrant that I see right here that I've, I've made larger. All the other documents here are associated with it because you have, there's grants, there's surveys, there's land transfers. She's pulled all that in to where whatever connects, however it was then transferred on, it's right there. 
So once you find the one connection, she's pulled those all together and you can literally explore to your heart's content. And like I said, you can download high resolution. It's fantastic, but don't ever forget, this is a really, really great, great resource. So another collection I need to talk to you about fairly briefly is the Draper Manuscript Correct Collection because um, this collection, these are, these were produced by a man named Lyman Copeland Draper, and he was trying to document the history of the Trans-Allegheny West. So he's going after migration specifically, and the areas that he's covering, the Carolinas, Virginia, Georgia, Alabama, the entire Ohio Valley, and the Mississippi Valley. He's trying to cover the time period from the 1740s to the 1810s, um, into like War of 1812. And there are nearly 500 volumes in this collection. The State Historical Society of Wisconsin owns the originals, um, but they are now on microfilm. They have been for years. A lot of people have heard about these. These have been around for a long time, but a lot of places own a microfilm copy of these, especially in Kentucky, because Kentucky is a really big portion of this collection. So the thing is, they've never been digitized. You'd have to use a microphone collection. Now, SAR, we have a collection here. You can come here and use them. Um, several universities have them. Um, so yeah, hunt that down. Even if you're out of Kentucky, a lot of universities will have access to the Draper Manuscript, especially, especially if you're the Mississippi East, you know, you're gonna have more, uh, more, more access to the Draper collection. And just some stats. Again, time frame covered 1740s to 1812. He interviewed those who either lived through the time, so it wasn't him, um, or those who were basically one generation or two generations past. Area covered was 21 states east of the Mississippi, plus Iowa, Missouri, and parts of Canada. And these interviews and collected snippets, information about the time, but also transcribed documents. So if anybody brought him a document, he's transcribing that and putting that in there. 575 early maps are also included in here. And during the interviews, he also tried to get family information. So um, there was one person I know, and actually this is an SAR story from when I worked at KHS. There was a gentleman trying to prove uh, parentage to a revolutionary soldier. And I suggested that he try Draper, he had not. And honestly, I just said, well, I, I said, hold on, I'm gonna go check and I will tell you why it's a little bit difficult to use this collection, but I went to check one of the indexes and I found, I found the guy right off the bat and there was literally a, a transcribed Bible record of the entire family unit. And he was like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I needed. This is exactly it. And so, yeah, I went to the original Draper and pulled out you know, the copy of it. So that's what's amazing. He's not only trying to get the experiences of those who lived from this time period, but he's also trying to get their family information, where they came from. He's documenting migration. He's trying to, the migration plus the experience is what he's really after. Total is 491 volumes divided into 50 series. And basically the, it is, there's no comprehensive index. There are several indexes or indices um, that are separated through the calendar series books, which we have a set of those. Then there's another one called um, the Guide to the Draper Manuscript, which includes at least three indexes inside, but it's not comprehensive. You need to look through all of those to see if your family is inside. Um, and again, there's still a chance something could be missed. Um, they're really messy. As far as using, you know, you got to read that 18th century, 19th century handwriting, but oh, there's so much gold in there. I'm going to show you just a little bit. Well, actually, let me finish real quick. Military records and information throughout this collection, particular strength, Revolutionary War, War of 1812, um, especially those actions which occurred in the West. The guide to the collection specifically indexes Revolutionary War pension application information. Other strengths, there's Native American conflicts and Western, Westward explorations in which the military played a role, such as Lewis and Clark. And again, only a small part of the collection consists of original documents of the Revolutionary period. 
Um, so the bulk of these are his research notes, correspondence, handwritten reproductions. And um, again, it's very, it's just, it's very diverse. And there's a lot of interview notes. And he's usually interviewing someone who lived through it, their child or their grandchild. That's it. It's that window of opportunity. So just think if we could go back and even just interview, you know, a child of a revolutionary soldier or a grandchild. It's a lot closer than we've got today, you know? So I love these. Now, again, here's just an example real quick. This is from, um, this is what one of them looks like. If you pull this up, this is what they look like on microfilm. And so they're a little painful to use, but once you do get through those, I'm just showing you this one because this is literally an account of a family who was migrating down the Ohio River to settle. And this was their experience. Um, and it actually comes, there's a few different pages. And the reason why I pull this out is because in Draper, this one family journey down the Ohio River, um, he documents it three times because there's three accounts. Two come from different family members, maybe even a third one because there's one that's print this one's print, down the Ohio River, the following sketch kindly furnished by, yes, this is a third one. So Mr. Marvin B. Christ, as dictated to him in 1863 by his grandfather, Joseph Liston, son of Edmund and Elizabeth Kester Liston. Edmund Liston and family immigrated from Maryland to Kentucky in 1786. They traveled overland to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where they took water on a flat boat in company with another boat belonging to two brothers by the name of Cox, who were immigrating to the same locality. There were 10 men in the party, five to each boat. During the voyage down the river, Edmund Liston concluded to go ashore and procure game. And a Negro called Gabe, who was with the company in addition to the white men and the two coxes rode him ashore. Indian signs were so plain that it was evident that the woods were full of them and Edmund returned to the boat. Cox and his brother, however, called on Gabe to see them over. And as they insisted, now the story goes, I don't have the rest of this image, but basically, um, they were killed. Um, they were ambushed and killed. Now, what's fascinating is in two of the two of the accounts of this migration story, you have usually the white men named. This is one that actually named the enslaved person, which is that's valuable right in itself. And then this a third one actually gets into, and, and you can see where they've underlined names in here. It then talks about where each one of these Cox men settled later. Not all of them went to Kentucky. Like one of them went to Kentucky, two went to Ohio, and it tells where. So you've got a migration journey, the whole story of their migration in, where they came from, where they landed, the tragedy that ensued when they landed, and then where they ended up uh, settling permanently. And so that's what Draper can do. This is the kind of migration stories that you can get through Draper. Um, here's just some more of the details. The reason I pulled that one up is because I actually had a family story about one of my ancestors that I'm still researching. And it says that it was the Cox family. They came down the river and one of them was killed by, uh, by Indians. And I, I don't, you know, I don't know. I'm still researching it. But here's Draper has an account of Cox family coming down. I'm like, is that my family? I don't know. I'm going to research all the different Cox men, see if I can connect back through collateral lines but again, if Draper wasn't here, I wouldn't have the story. So it's, it's really amazing. So shifting gears just a little bit, I do like to cover land speculation when I talk about migration into Kentucky because it involved a lot of people and a lot of different groups. So we had people land speculating from the east to the west, from the north to the south, south to the north. Everywhere, they were coming in, they were speculating as much as they could. Even George Washington was part of a big land speculation company that had a lot of land in Kentucky, even though he wasn't, you know, he wasn't over here surveying, he was too old for that at that time. But he was involved financially through land speculation. We've carved out this giant piece of land. That's tens of thousands of acres, hundreds of thousands of acres. And here it is, you know, you gotta get settlers in here to, to live and to, to improve the lands. So, you know, and once they did get here, they didn't stop. There were a lot of people that then kept speculating, even outside Kentucky. So, and, and actually for Kentucky families, 
Ohio and Mississippi, these are big players in long-term speculation that stretched all the way into the mid 19th century. So that's, there's a lot of farming connections back and forth with these, these groups. And it's something to keep in mind. You've got to keep in mind as you're researching your different branches. So we know, we know about the wilderness road coming in through the gap down there, through the mountains. And this is part of the settlement rush spearheaded by the Transylvania Company. And this leads them all the way to Boonesboro in the central Kentucky area. Well, the Wilderness Road was something that was, the path may have existed, but there was the financial backing of the Transylvania, Transylvania Company that then took money in and started literally improving the road so you could get more and more settlers through there. Um, and so that's part of the money. Down the Ohio River, you have settlers rushing down the limestone and of course, all the way to Louisville too. Um, you know, they're not, all, they're not stopping. There's limestone, then there's Cincinnati, or should I have got in here, Fort Washington, Los Anteville, um, and then down to Louisville. Those three areas are, are developing very rapidly in succession, very, very similar to the same, same time period. Um, and so you've got, you've got these, these, these little centers here, insurance offices, Fort Pitt in Cincinnati to insure flatboats. Um, in fact, one of the one of the episodes we have for Kentucky Ancestors coming up is about a man named Flatboat George, who settled in the Mayfield uh, Maysville area, and his the reason why they call him that is because his flatboat, since you can't use it to go back, you can either settle you can either sell it to somebody who's going further down the river, otherwise you can't go backwards with it because it has no boat, it has no motor, can't go back. Um, he then used the wood of the flatboat to construct his cabin which is still in old Washington, Kentucky right now. Um, so yeah, this is, it's a whole system though. This, this whole migration push down the river, all those other cities farther up the river, they're catering to settlers, they're helping to build these flatboats, they're insuring them. It's a whole business, a lot of money tied into it. So again, land speculation, Mississippi River to Missouri, Tennessee, Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana, a lot of land, it just expands. But Kentucky is like your first, the very first major land speculation that, that really hits because we're a state by, 70, by 92. Ohio is not until what, 05? I mean, it's, you know, we're, we're the first. But then from there, the West opens up and it just keeps going. So, Revolutionary War, that brought in uh, Western Kentucky military warrants. Remember I talked about the different kinds of patent series, the land series. Um, Revolutionary War land parcels were more, more out into the western part of the state. So think about that. War of 1812, Kentucky folks got, there was Illinois and Missouri land. Um, but just because they got land didn't mean they left. Some of them just bought it. I mean, sold it, sold the parcels that they were awarded. And so then there were people out there that were speculating, bought up a lot of these parcels and then sold them all the way out there. So it was a whole churning system that kept going. Then we had the rise of federal public domain lands. Um, as we know, Kentucky was meets and bounds. Um, federal, we only had a little part of our state, Western part that's federal after the Jackson purchase. Um, but then the, fed, the federal government gets involved. So you've got more federal sales going on. Um, Soldiers could sell their warrants, which could be exchanged for land and then parceled out for sale, which gets people even more out west. So the players, the reason again why I bring up land speculation, typical profile land speculator, white, male, wealthy, but not as wealthy as you might think. There was a lot of opportunity for a lot of middle class folks. Um, you had extremely wealthy to moderately wealthy partners to somewhat wealthy second sons. Um, third sons, fourth sons, you had a lot of family trickle down, people trying to get on board. Some of them were honest, some of them were somewhat honest, and some of them were con artists. You had a total mixed bag of the people that were involved in land speculation, um, either buying up, selling to your ancestors, or your ancestor was the one selling. It was, it was a bit of a mixed bag, um, but they were packaging in this. Think of Filson and, and Henderson with the Transylvania Company. 
they were selling the dream. They were trying to really promote this to get as many people out there as possibly could. Um, the Transylvania Company, uh, Richard Henderson and Daniel Boone, this was a whole group of people that were doing this. This was the Treaty of Sycamore Shoals, which is where the largest parcel came from the Cherokee. And there's a whole story behind that about those who sold the land, Cherokee land to the Transylvania Company. They were not actually legally authorized to do that by, tribal, by the tribal elders. They were acting like they were, but they weren't. And so therefore there's this whole controversy over the fact that that was a duplicitous deal. Um, but we're talking 17 million acres. I mean, that's a huge amount of land. Revolutionary War had impact. It slowed some of the land speculation, but as soon as that war was over and we won, it picked right up. So remember I mentioned John Filson, him trying to get George Washington to endorse the second edition of his book and his map. Um, John Filson alone had 13,000 acres. And so boy, he, he marketed the heck out of that. He developed his product. He marketed it well. He had the book, the map, and again, he was trying to get that second edition endorsed, but Washington vetoed that. So that didn't go, but it still, it didn't temper anybody's enthusiasm. They still came out West. They still came to Kentucky. I mean, it was beautiful. Seriously, the word of mouth alone, once they got to the bluegrass area alone was just, I mean, it was Athens of the West. I mean, it was just the buzz. What is it? The buzz is about Kentucky, they say. So it was a beautiful place to come. <laughs> So land speculation, think about the network that's involved with this. Friends and colleagues, family members, investors, agents, surveyors, advertising, printing, financial, treasurer, the guides, all of this network, your family could have been touched by this. Your family could have been involved in this. Um, there, one of my favorite books is a book called Voices from the Century Before. It was written by Mary Clay Berry. And she was, she's a clay descendant from, um, oh goodness, I think it's Brutus Clay, who was living in Bourbon County. And the book is this thick, it's humongous. And it's basically just full of the letters that they found in the attic of their house that dates back from like the 1830s, I believe. And it's back and forth with all the different clay family groups that was in Kentucky. So you've got the Richmond Clays, you've got... Um, you know, so like for Whitehall, but then Richmond itself, you've got the Bourbon County Clays, you've got the Fayette County Clays. I mean, all of these people and their letters back and forth. And one of the most surprising thing I think that, that hit me was the land speculation that was going on with some of the younger sons and how they were taking a lot of their family's wealth and investing in larger parcels of land further south. We're talking Mississippi, Louisiana, and then writing back and forth. And they were taking their wives and their kids. And sadly, several of them, several of them didn't make it. They were dying of yellow fever. But I was just amazed at how that connection to this Clay families in Kentucky, how it was just this road down into Mississippi. And Kentucky Historical Society has another collection um, of, of enslaved folks that were taken to Mississippi and they're writing back to their family. And I know that sounds bizarre, enslaved people writing back to other enslaved. It's, it's a long story. There was someone writing for them um, because they were not educated except for one that I knew of. But it's that network of people, the friends and the colleagues, even an enslaved group, they're writing back to their colleagues and families in Kentucky. So just because the speculation happens, it just means that the network is there. So that means that you should broaden your research focus, because if you catch a whiff at all that you think maybe there should be fam there's a family that's connected to the system at all, think about where they ended up, think about where the records may have ended up. Um, it's just, it opens some doors where there may be some brick walls for you. So some issues, distance, obviously, this, especially the early years, you're working as long distance partnerships. You've got people in Virginia that are backing people in Kentucky obviously they're Virginians, but they're coming this way. So a lot of Virginians never actually left, but they're funding all of this, right? So they're hoping to reap some profits from it. But again, you've got long distance and you've got some letters going back and forth, which is crossing state boundaries. Because of the sometimes nefarious practices 
business practices, you had shingling of land parcels. So with meets and bounds, they didn't quite always get it right. I mean, think about what their landmarks were to parcel out a piece of land. It was about um, from this sycamore tree to this boulder over here. And ooh, there's some interpretation there. But with all of that, that means you had overlaid surveys and legal disputes. In fact, almost half the private suits filed in federal court from 1789 to 1816 were due to land disputes. Now, just think about that, though. If your ancestor happens to be in one of those land disputes, their, their migration story is right there. Like, it's, it's going to talk about, hey, I came in, I settled this, or I had this surveyed, and I settled, and I made improvements, and then this other person is claiming it. You've literally got another record group that is outlying, or outlining your, your migration. So do you suspect a speculator in your tree? If you miss some of the adult children or family in your tree, some of those branches, you can't find them anymore. Take a look at farther west, farther south. They may be speculators. <coughs> Pattern of family migration with each member buying up parcels. Look closely at the names on land documents. Are they connected? And they could be connected in many ways. It may not be direct line of descent, could be married in. Think about all the different ways, could be, could be business partners, different ways that they could be connected. Um, as I mentioned, the Secretary of State Land Office, um, those name entries, there's many, many parcels that, that fit into this whole system. And then Eastern Kentucky up through the Civil War. Um, yeah, that was interesting. Um, in, the East, in Eastern Kentucky, there were several parts of Eastern Kentucky that really hadn't been claimed by anyone because, well, it's a little bit harder to farm out there. You didn't have coal mining yet. What are you going to do with all this land? So by the time the Civil War came around, um, the federal government actually was trying to get rid of some of this. And so you had some local governments. It's a long story. But I'm just going to say, even my ancestor, as like for, um, it was for like a thank you or, or like um, loyalty. Basically, they were uh, granting some land in one of the counties in Eastern Kentucky to my ancestor as a union supporter. And so you, you get all this, you get a local person who's buying up a bunch of this because the union governor is saying, we need to make sure that this territory is in, you know, in, in, uh, in, in US hands. So they're making sure that these parcels are getting out, but that's late. I mean, look how late that is, you know, civil war. We're still looking at speculators because the guy that my, that came, the land came through to my, my ancestor. Yeah, he bought up a ton uh, from the government. And so, and then therefore he's getting them to loyal men, he's, he's, you know, selling them to loyal men in the area, but you just see his name constantly as he's selling off these different parcels that he had gotten. And each one signed by the governor, because it was a whole system, whole system going on here. Um, I think of point of departure connections, um, you know, where, where are families still together? And then where are they no longer together? Um, if, if some of those units go away, move farther west, where is it where they were last connected to the family? Um, that family that stayed may be your key to finding the records that may have been left behind there. So don't always think about where they ended up, think about where they also, their point of departure, where they left. Whoops, 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 went too fast. Documentation, there's no specific collection, you need to play detective. I'd mentioned Draper earlier, that's a great way to go too. Throw the rule book out of the window, Context, family lore, mapping migration routes of all your family members. Um, and that's a good tip to do for anything. Mapping where your ancestors came from, where they settled, where they stopped along the way, where different branches got off and settled. It definitely can help with your research. Um, you know, associates of prominent men and, you know, all these different prominent men in the land and the different different um, landmarks or forts that are named after them. That's another place of connection for all these different people coming in and then maybe going out. Church movements coming in, going out. Um, again, that can tie back into regional repositories for records. And then there's delayed or gradual settlement. Um, you know, I had talked earlier in the presentation about 
connecting all of these different types of, of reasons and, and people. And so think about the chain of family links that gets, that is part of the migration movement. And again, delayed or gradual, there's a lot, a lot of instances where you've got one family member that comes out here to Kentucky and maybe with his family, and we're talking over the next 20, 30, 40 years, you've got other family members, siblings or whatnot that are coming out gradually and settling eventually on their own parcel. So it's not just a quick thing, it's over many, many years. Strong family ties, this can mean a lot of correspondence and much still exists. Again, like I said, look at archives near previous residents, points of departure, new settlements. Look for tax evidence of large parcels held outside of the county residence. Um, I know specifically of one where, um, goodness, I didn't, realize, I didn't realize how big his holdings were until I got a hold of his tax records. And he had large parcels that were in counties that were all the way down. Now, this is a guy that's in Harrison County. So you guys probably know that's bluegrass, right? Just above um, Bourbon and, and Fayette. And he owned large parcels in about four different counties that were down along the Tennessee border. And this is the 1830s, right before he actually moved to Illinois because he was a War of 1812 veteran. Um, but his county of tax, sorry, his county of residence where he was paying taxes, he listed all of his land parcels where he owned them, how much he owned, and he was paying the taxes on him right there in that county. Instead of having to go all the way down to these different counties, he was paying taxes in his home county. But that was a huge sign of speculation. And that tells me he has connections, document connections in the counties that are along the Tennessee border. So again, it opened up more documentation routes for me. Deed transfers and court records. Oh my goodness, so many of these. Um, Kentucky Department for Libraries and Archives has the largest collection of deed transfers or deeds and court records, hands down. And so you need to, once you trace that land over time, trace your family, um, be sure to, to connect with them. Probate records and estate disputes. Absolutely, you're gonna see estate divisions and different things. And they're gonna talk about various land parcels maybe held by, by the patriarch of the family. Newspaper adverts and notices. Actually, I've got an example. I thought it was the next slide, but it's not. Um, newspaper adverts. A lot of these speculators that got in, you know, they would then have these little tiny newspaper notices about uh, that they want to sell off these pieces. And so if that's your ancestor, that's a big old sign there that either they're in land speculation or they just bit off a little bit too much to chew and they needed to offload a little bit of that. But again, it's a sign. Here's just... Um, just some land speculation documentation. Again, we've got um, some, some parcels listed over here in a state settlement. And then of course, here's the draw from the Transylvania company. There's a lot of original records out there that can help you. Um, here's the diary of William Cock leading a group of settlers into Kane Tuck in 1775, um, which joined Newton Henderson's group just before going through the Cumberland Gap. So there's some documentation of the families that they're taking in uh, and things like that. Here's one of those, that's what I was hoping for for that next slide, was uh, some of the little adverts that would be in the paper um, about like, we're talking two tracks here, 550 acres in this one, 35,000, 35,250 acres of valuable land lying on the waters of Green River, um, laid out in seven separate surveys. The whole or any part will be sold upon a liberal credit a good and sufficient title made upon the payment of the purchase money applied to John Postlewaite, Lexington. So that's 1799, 35,250 acres. Wow, that's a lot, you know? So each of these, there's Daniel Mosby selling some, George Mooter. So, you know, these men were putting these in the early newspapers. And as far as access to early newspapers, if I were you, clearly chronicling America is a big one because some of the early newspapers were in Lexington. That's already been digitized. It's already online. And then there's a few others, uh, a few other databases I could cover, um, but I just didn't, I'm not gonna get into all of those. You guys know a lot of them. So quickly, last thing, later waves of immigration. 
we breached, we, we touched upon this briefly, but remember we talked about the urban clusters, Louisville and Cincinnati. So in other words, if you've got any, that maybe they made it to the Louisville area, great. Um, if they made it to Cincinnati, great as well. But think about that. Louisville's got Indiana on the other side. Covington has Cincinnati, that's across, it's another state, you guys. So it's a different record set, a different record collection. So be really cognizant of the fact that you really should cross the river and or the state and be open-minded about finding records of immigration in, uh, in, in the other states that are nearby. So turn of the 20th century, we also had a whole lot of um, other European groups coming in, coming in also, they're touching base in those urban centers, but branching out agriculturally and pay attention to their occupations. Some of them are unique to settlement areas. So you get a lot of distilling coming in. Um, actually, that's gonna be mid 19th century, actually. Mine, mine, mine came in making a lot of wine, actually, um, in the Ohio Valley. They started in Ohio and then they moved to Kentucky and they kept up that, that distilling spirits or that, that uh, wine production all the way through prohibition, actually. They never stopped. And um, so yeah, think about their, uh, their occupations. Coopers, they're making barrels. What are they doing? How are they connected to other groups that are settling that are of the same immigration waves coming in, little clusters, even if they went agricultural? A lot of them still settled in agricultural areas where other folks from their, you know, their, their home country had also settled. Um, so that's definitely something to, to keep an eye out. So who's leaving? Um, land after War of 1812, well into the 1830s, we've got people migrating west. Clearly, that just westward migration just keeps going. Once it's open, it just never really stops. Slavery and emancipation, think about that as well. Who gets emancipated? Do they stay in Kentucky? Some of them do. Um, we clearly do have a population of free people of color, but a lot of them, especially with the laws, they're not supposed to stay. Um, or it gets, by the time you get to the 1830s, it becomes even more dangerous to stay. So you've got a lot of, um, a lot of migration. And then after the Civil War, with Reconstruction, you get migrations north, a lot of migrations north, um, up until, yeah, through Jim Crow, you get a lot of migrations north um, of, of descendants of formerly enslaved people. And again, westward expansion. New generations, they're following the same, they've got the same wanderlust that their ancestors had. So follow those lines west for documentation, follow those chain links of documentation and family connections. Here's one that I will give you again. Hey, I was a KHS for 10 years, so I'm gonna have some KHS stories every once in a while. But um, there was one that I can't even tell you what the collection was, but I was, hey, I love Vegas. I love Las Vegas. It's fun. I've been there about five times. It's a fun place, but I love the history that's out there because it's purely a, a United States. It is clearly, it's purely an American city. I mean, it literally just sprung from the desert and it's this really wild and crazy place. But for those of you who've ever been to Vegas or have heard of Vegas, they've heard of the Fremont, Fremont Street. Well, I kind of was familiar with some of the, um, some of the history behind that because I do love some of the history of how Vegas just evolved and I was in one of the collections in KHS in the archives and it had it was a Missouri collection um, of a family and their family name was um, Fremont Boone and I can't remember there was one other one and I was just going through it uh, looking for something else and I discovered in the back there was this little publication and it was from John Fremont and it was literally a, a pamphlet of his experience exploring the area at West. This is before Las Vegas ever existed. And it was the Fremont Expeditions. This is how he originally published it. In other words, this is an original pamphlet that he did for the first one, one of his expeditions. He sent it back to Missouri because that's where his family stayed. His family lines were still in Missouri. He sent it back, I believe it was to his brother. So that an original Fremont pamphlet is sitting in the archive in the Kentucky Historical Society because the Missouri family also had Kentucky connections back into the Boones. And so it ended up in Kentucky, right? I mean, so that's how crazy 
you know, that document trails can really be. And so with Westward Expansion, you just never know what connections we have. Wherever they land, always look along the route that they may have come out because there's so many repositories that may have what it is that you're looking for. So this is all I have for you today. This, if you've never been to our lovely, beautiful library here in Louisville, um, this is the National, and again, I'm gonna say that again, National Sons of the American Revolution Library. In other words, this library is not just about Kentucky, it's about the national lineage um, of our country. And so you're gonna get a really, really fantastic collection. If you're anyways near this area, come see us. Now, we have been by appointment only, but beginning May 2nd, we are open once again to walk-in visitors. And we also, if anyone in the Louisville area, especially because I'm talking to a Louisville group, if anyone would like to volunteer, we would love to have new volunteers come and help us keep this library open. Um, as of right now, I'm a staff of two. There's myself and Robin, if those of you who know Robin, uh, a complete um, an institution in this place, dear sweet lady. And um, so it's the two of us and we hope to hire another um, employer too, but we would love to have some volunteers help us with this because it's a beautiful, beautiful place and people come needing a lot of help. And so genealogy groups are probably the best. And also too, I know you guys used to have um, in-person meetings. Was it the third Saturday that you guys used to have of the month? Is that correct? Not us. We've always met the second and fourth Tuesday of the month. Okay. And then we have fifth Tuesday trips. We've made trips down to the SAR library. It's been a okay. few years, but we've made those trips on fifth uh, okay. Tuesdays of a month. Gotcha. Well, we are going to be open Monday through Friday, 930 to 430. But the third Saturday of the month, we will be open. So every month, third Saturday, spread the word and come research. Well, thank you, Sherry. This has been wonderful. And the comments have have reiterated it. Many are saying excellent webinar. It's just fantastic. I look forward to researching. Um, but a couple of questions here. And so let me go to those questions. Um, I, I see one see about, I see one about, um, oh, a link that I was going to share with you all. Here's something I'm going to share. I guess what you're doing, I want to reiterate, uh, there was no handout today, but this is being recorded and it will be posted on our website. It takes a couple of days to get it up. It will be behind our member wall. So if you'd like to go through it again, somebody said, well, I'm dyslexic. I really would have liked the handout. Well, you can go visit our website and listen to Sherry and take it piece by piece. Um, so that's there and it'll be up uh, indefinitely right now. We right. also, Sherry is going to tell you, we do have Candy Atkins was with us within the last year and her presentation on land records in Kentucky is also in our collection online. So if Perfect. you would like to see that uh, webinar by Candy on uh, land records in Kentucky, uh, go to our website and you can access it there. That's awesome. In fact, that's what I was going to share was... Um, the link I put in there was the PDF that Candy Atkinson has put up about the uh -huh. different land patent series. So where there's nine major groups yes. and it discusses the reasons behind why they exist and their time frame. So that Super. is very handy. It's, it's PDF form. So you can use that as a little bit of handout. It's just not mine. It's Candy's. <laughs> we'll, we'll give cheat. Candy credit. Yeah, we'll give credit. Totally. Um, yeah, somebody mentioned Fremont was French Canadian. Yes, but it was... Um, like through his mother line, his mother's line, um, who was actually some of them were settled in, then married into the Boone line. So you had some of them in Missouri and out of Kentucky. So which surprised the heck out of me. I had no idea yeah. there would be a connect Kentucky connection to something like that. Um, um, you also said that those Draper papers are at the SAR library. I yes. think they're also across. They're just a couple blocks away at the Free Public Library main branch. And okay. I think they're down at the Clark Library in Frankfurt too, because I yep. have access them there. Exactly. So I would suggest to people Google those Draper papers and learn how to access those um, calendars, they call them, instead of an index. And if you Google it, there's lots out there on how to access those Draper papers, because they're not user-friendly, are they, Sherry? 
They're not. They're not. They're full of gold, but yet full it's so hard yes. to mine it. Right. I used them to help um, a gentleman <laughs> join the Cincinnati Society. So yes, and yeah. it was a key document. So yes, yeah. those interviews with relatives it will yeah. document where they've been, how they got there, who they were with. Right. Those are excellent. Um, yes. so, well, another question was, where would you find records? And I think you kind of answered this, but let's see if you can repeat it for us. Where would you find those records of those land disputes? Um, not usually online for those. Um, uh -huh. Probably with KDLA, so Kentucky Department for Libraries and Archives, because those are going to be court records or sometimes in the courthouses. I mean, it depends on where yeah. they, you know, where that's filed or where it's retained. But well, would they all be in Kentucky or would some be like in Virginia? Some might be right. They might be out of state. The that's, Library that's of Virginia true. might be another place to access yeah. land disputes because that's Kentucky fair. was originally yes. part of the Virginia Commonwealth, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, somebody also asked, it said the link about the land patents you gave us, are those accessible online and where? I'm going to go ahead and go back to the original. Um, I'm just going to go back. Whoopsie. Okay. No. Aha. This is my favorite. So this is kind of what I would call Candy Atkinson's made hub. So if you go to this right here, it's kind of this almost like a navigation portal that she has put together. So you can get to the ones that have been digitized. Just keep in mind that like when it says all these different ones, all of them, like Virginia and old Kentucky, that's a patent series. You got to go there and look through all of those. Then there's West of Tennessee. You got to go there and look through all of those. In other words, there's no one place that you can type in somebody's name. You've got to go to each one of the different databases they have digitized and put up online. And I want to say out of the nine, you guys might want to email or call Candy and ask her exactly how many, because, you know, I'm going to say probably about five years ago, we knew that about two thirds of them had been digitized and available for free online. I want to say budgeting and funding was a little bit of an issue. So I want to say they stopped, but there's still a ton of them there and, and they're fantastic. And I would imagine with the, by the time I left KHS, there was some surplus government money coming in. So I'm hoping that she got some extra money to do some finish up digitizing yeah. those because they're a wonderful resource. Um, you mentioned you need volunteers. Who would they, would they contact you if they're interested in volunteering at the library? Absolutely. And I will pipe in my, um, my email address. That'd be super. There you go. Yes, absolutely. New okay. one, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, and I have a couple other topics. We're going to have to get you back here to present uh, <laughs> again. Uh, just too much information. Can you name, do you know, remember, can recall the name of that book that had the Clay families? Um, yes, it is. Where's this from the century? Whoops, I can spell right. And just for everybody to know, we're corresponding here back and forth on chat. So if you click your little chat icon at the bottom, you can see these websites that Sherry's posting in the name of the book. Yes. Voices. And yeah, Voices from the Century Before by Mary Clayberry. It's been out, oh goodness, probably a good 15 years, okay. but there should be plenty of them around. And what's fantastic too, if you connect with the Clay family at all, not only the land speculation, but there's some wonderful family charts in the beginning of that on how all those clay men and family units connect together. And I love it. It's a great book. Somebody just asked in your link about the land patents you just gave us, are those accessible online and where? Um, that's, that's basically anything that would be available is through the Secretary of State Land Office. So that, that one link that I gave you, which was kind of the portal link, mm -hmm. the sos.ky.gov forward slash land, go there and you'll be able to see the different kinds. And if they have been digitized, they're available through there. Yeah. And again, I've looked there, be creative with your ancestor's name. Yes. 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 Uh, um, if you just look for one form of that name, you're going to miss it. So, and it's interesting, the databases are different. So like, for instance, if you go into the Virginia and old Kentucky patent series, you can choose to browse by name which is wonderful. But then if you get into some of the other digitized groups um, on this site, it's type in. And so like she said, 
you need to, um, yeah, you would need to type in various versions of that. Now, those lay patents would also include patents for the French and Indian War? Because you, you know, yeah. they think uh, yes. can, yes, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, Sherry, I want you to know, we had people today here from Montana, Florida, California, Colorado, Missouri, the state of Washington, and a slew from Kentucky. So uh -huh. it's kind of neat to know how many places, of course, you know, the, the outward bound obviously took them all the way out that Oregon Trail up to Washington Absolutely. and California. So these people are searching their Kentucky ancestors back here before yes. they hit the road. Absolutely. So Sherry, thank you so, so much. Your voice held up great. Awesome. The PowerPoint was wonderful. Uh, again, uh, we appreciate you taking time out of a very busy schedule as you're crossing over from one position to another to share with right. us. Um, and again, everybody, check our website. Look at what our activities are for the month of May. Uh, get in your car and travel down there to that library. I love it. It gives me goosebumps as soon as I walk into it. It's just such okay. a neat library that so FBI beautiful. library is. And one other thing, I'm going to be going to be as we as we develop. I'll be having more programs and things, um, specifically out at the library and some virtual. Um, we do have a Facebook group, which is the if you search for it, I wonder if I can actually, I'm going to try to put it in the chat. We'll see if that works. Um, <laughs> so we'll try that. Um, but yeah, because it's called SAR Genealogical Research Library. That is a group. Anyone can join it. Um, or sorry, it's a page. It's a page. I hope to actually develop a group. More, more coming yeah. on all that. But um, yeah, I will be posting some more um, announcements and things like that. Things happen in the library right there. Super. I also want to put out a thank you to all the um, SAR members who joined us today because I heard that kind of went out to the Thurston chapter and so we might have picked up a few there so glad to have you here check our website for more presentations and we're going to try and get Sherry back here in the next year or so and get her to do another presentation for us. Sounds um, great. So thank you, Sherry. We'll let everybody go. I hope everybody had, it sounds like everybody had a great experience today. So again, we thank you, Sherry, and thank you for joining us today and look forward to seeing everybody in May. Thank you all. Bye. Bye, Sherry. Thank you.